Well, you are very welcome to this talk. Now, a few days ago, probably last week, we looked at the history of the cholera pump with Dr. John Snow in Soho in London. And we learned so many lessons. When I was preparing that, it was amazing how many applications to our current situation came out. And I want to do the same today with uh, Ignaz Philipp Semmelweis, the, uh, the famous doctor who discovered the cause of death in patients dying of puperial fever. So let's look at this one now. And again, the lessons for the present day. When I started to prepare the lessons for today, I, I thought of about three or four, then another three or four, then another three or four. And we ended up with loads. And you're about to think of lots more. It really is quite uncanny the way we can learn from history to identify the mistakes of today and to hopefully prevent the mistakes of tomorrow. That's the aim anyway. So this is a, a, a Ingans Philipp Semmelweis. Now he was ridiculed, he was attacked, uh, he was poo-pooed, he was destroyed and eventually, arguably, you could say he was murdered. Certainly his death was facilitated because of the truths he was uh, proclaiming. So 1846, he started work as an obstetrician doctor in uh, Vienna General Hospital. And uh, at that time, postpartum infection, puperial fever, childbed fever, all the same thing. Bacterial infection caused by the uh, infection of the reproductive tract after childbirth was killing huge amounts of women. Now, there was two main clinics in Vienna at that time. And what we see here is the first clinic had these death rates, so uh, 7% up to 16% death rates. I mean, if you think about it, that means that 16 out of, out of every 100 women that came in uh, to deliver babies died of, of this fever, of this puperial fever. Quite an appalling situation. And it, they were high all the time through uh, 1841 to 1846. Now, the second clinic, the the death rates were bad, they were appalling, but way, way lower. And Semmelweis records that um, he saw women um, begging on their knees not to be sent to the first clinic. And a lot of women deliberately delayed their admission to hospital and gave birth in the street rather than go to this first clinic because of its an appalling reputation. But of course, for a researcher, you've got a perfect question there. What is the difference between these two? Why is the death rate so much higher in the clinic with uh, clinic one than it is in, in clinic two? Now, um, sepsis from infection acquired in hospital, healthcare associated infections or nosocomial infections. That's the modern twist on, on what we were saying to this. And um, people delivered uh, on the streets or at home and they also had low mortality rates. In fact, their, low, their mortality rate was uh, lower, if anything. We don't actually have the data on that, but it was probably lower than the, uh, the data from the second clinic. So just what was the difference between these two? Now, Samuel Weiss was aware of quite a few things. So he, tried, he considered the environment, he tried modifying the environment without effect. Um, but he was aware that Clinic 1 was worked mostly by obstetricians and medical students, and Clinic 2 was worked mostly by midwives and student midwives. So that was a big difference. But obviously you would think the doctors are cleverer than the midwives, would you? Um, anyway, we'll leave that one hanging. <laughs> but but the, the, the doctors were, for want of a better word, killing uh, way more people uh, than the midwives. So, so what is the difference? Now, of course, they've been doing post-mortems uh, for some time on the women that were dying. And what they found in the organs after the fever and the puperial fever was pyema in the organs. So they found pus in the main organs. And we now know, of course, that's caused by bacterial infection, primarily in this case, uh, streptococcal uh, bacterial infection that affects the genital tract and uh, becomes uh, systemic. So they knew that this pyema was found in the kidneys, the liver, the main organs. Infection was everywhere. That's what was killing these poor young women. And then he made a key observation uh, the death of Jacob Kolkowski in 1847. Now, Dr. Kolkowski was a pathologist, anatomist, and one of his students uh, stabbed him with a scalpel during a post-mortem on one of the women that had died from puperial fever who had this disseminated pyema. And within a few days, Dr. Kolkowski himself became sick, 
And he had exactly the same manifestations as the women had, which was strange because he was a man. But he was having exactly the same manifestations as the women. Sadly, he died uh, within a week or so. And then during uh, Dr. Kolkowski's post-mortem, exactly the same pathology as was seen in a man as was seen in the women that died of puperial fever. Of course, it's obvious to us now that that was caused by the streptococcus that got in through the, uh, th through the cut from the infected scalpel that he was stabbed with. So that was, that was Semmelweis's breakthrough. And from that, he reasoned that there was cadaveric toxins or cadaveric particles that were being transmitted from the dead women into living subjects, causing the disease. And dead tissue, of course, stinks. So why not get rid of the smell? Why not get rid of the smell of these cadaverous particles? And that's exactly what he did. Um, he drew that link between cadaveric con contamination from the dead people, contamination and the puperial fever. He postulated the existence of these, of these cadaverous particles. And in 1847, he instigated hand-washing, chlorinated lime, calcium hypochlorite solution, which got rid of the smell. So that was in 1847. Now, these cadaverous particles, of course, he couldn't see them. The microscopy that was available to um, um, Louis Pasteur just 20 years later wasn't available to, to Philippe Semmelweis. <clears throat> so he postulated their existence. And this is one of the reasons that this is a, a well-known story, because universities often teach this as an example of the power of pure empiricism. Semmelweis didn't have the knowledge of germ theory, didn't have the knowledge of bacteria. Uh, that knowledge wasn't available in his part of the world at that time. Although uh, Joseph Simpson was starting to do some work about that time with antiseptics in, uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, early work in, the, in uh, Louis Pasteur's early work started very, very shortly after that. But um, he, he just inferred their existence. It was empirical. And then he produced data. Now, this, this graph is generated from the original data by um, power.corrupts. So thank you, power.corrupts, for these. And what this is showing is this is the death rate in patients here, the percentage death rates of uh, women coming in to give birth. 1841, 1842, 1843. Then he introduces chlorine hand wash here, and you see the death rate absolutely plummets after the introduction of chlorine hand wash. Ah, but I hear someone shout in the back row, that's just a temporal correlation. Correlation doesn't prove causality. Quite right, quite right. But we now know that there's a plausible mechanism that the, uh, the, the lime solution can get rid of the smells and get rid of the bacteria. And we also have to remember that correlation often does indicate causality. In this case, correlation did indicate causality. This drop here was not an arbitrary temporal correlation. It was a definite uh, cause, causal effect. It was the introduction of the chlorine hand washing that caused the lower death rates. And of course, there's lots of debates now about temporal correlation. More people are dying after particular interventions. Is this just a coincidence? Or just remember, in this case, correlation equaled causality. Our minds have to be open to that. So giving some of the data here, mortality rate in the first clinic decreased by 90%, as we see in Power Corrupt's uh, graph here. This massive reduction in the death rates, absolutely brilliant. This was in the first, uh, in the mortality in the first clinic decreased 90%. In April 1847, it had been 18.3%, nearly one in five women dying. Dear me, appalling. Hand wash started in mid May 1847. June 1847, the death rate had gone down from 18.3% down to 2.2% down to where the midwives had been uh, all along. Uh, July 1847, it was 1.2%. August 1847, it was 1.9%. And just, re again, remind ourselves of this dramatic drop in the reduction of deaths. And, of course, these are deaths. These, this is an appalling situation. Everyone is, is a mother uh, who was not living to bring up their child. Tragedy for the mother, tragedy for the child, tragedy for the family, tragedy all round, unfortunately. Now, um, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1848, um, actually for two months there, there was 0% mortality. Incredible. 
1849, uh, Semmelweis was obliged to leave the obstetric clinic. So having brought about the biggest revolution in obstetric care in history, Semmelweis was essentially sacked because his ideas were not accepted by the medical establishment of the day. And he was attacked for having such ridiculous ideas. And we'll see why uh, shortly. He was ostracised. He was personally punished by being sacked. So um, again, if you can think of modern anal analogies there, you may want to put it in the comments. So he was obliged to leave in 1849. 1850, he left Vienna and he said this, I'm unable to endure further frustrations in dealing with the Vien Vien Viennese medical establishment. So what he did, 1851 to 1857, he was originally a Hungarian. So he went to Pest, which of course is part of Bud Budapest, and uh, he worked for six years uh, unpaid. Um, how he survived, I, I don't know. Um, he didn't get paid for, for these, uh, these, th th these six years' work. Um, but um, the puperial fever in the clinic in Pest uh, was virtually eliminated. In the time he was there, he delivered 933 ba babies, or 933 mothers. Uh, eight of those died tragically. That's a maternal mortality, uh, mortality rate of 0.85%. So given that it was 10, 18% before, it's a dramatic improvement. Absolutely incredible. And he did this without getting paid. Samuel Weiss's ideas were not accepted by other obstetricians, obstetricians in Budapest, so he was ostracised in Vienna. He was ostracised in Budapest. Now, interestingly, his ideas were much better received in England, uh, Scotland and uh, Germany. So his ideas were fairly well received then, consistent, as we said, with developing ideas from Louis Pasteur, with uh, Joseph Lister, who used his antiseptic sprays during surgery and dramatically improved uh, the prognosis and reduce surgical uh, infections. So this idea was already starting, so fairly well received, but where he was, as far as he was concerned at that time, he was just completely slammed, shut out, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. In 1861, he published his book, uh, Anthology, Concept and Prophylaxis of Child Bed Fever. Again, still not accepted in uh, Vienna and Hungary, but fairly well accepted in Europe, other parts of Europe like England, Scotland and Germany. But 1865, uh, his colleagues committed him to a, what was then called a lunatic asylum. Um, he was beaten up by the uh, guards. He injured his hand. It became gangrenous. So he had a gangrenous injury to his hand. And 14 days after being admitted to the uh, asylum, uh, he died in 1865 at the age of 47. So, we have a man here who was ridiculed, ostracised, poo-pooed, uh, decried, uh, isolated, and eventually, uh, well, d uh, not allowed to make a living, did, couldn't, couldn't earn any money, and eventually, essentially, murdered for his beliefs. So that's the story of Philippe Semmelweis. That's when the chlorine hand washing was instigated. And this graph also from um, Power Corrupts. Uh, this is quite interesting. So the dark line here is Ireland. We'll come on to that in a, in a minute in Dublin. The purple line here is the maternity in Vienna. And, and these are the death rates. So the death rates weren't that good, 2-3%, but they were bumbling along as some women got puperial fever. And then they introduced pathological anatomy in 1823. And then the death rates dramatically increased. So when the doctors were doing the post-mortems in the morning, they would do the post-mortems in the morning. Um, then they would go straight on to examine women, perhaps, well, very often doing PV uh, examinations um, and um, carrying, infecting them with the, the infection. So imagine they were dealing with this, uh, this the empyema, from the women that had died of puperial fever the day before with that purulent pus full of streptococcus. And then they were examining the women in the maternity ward without washing the hands. It doesn't bear thinking about. Uh, the midwives, their hygiene wasn't a lot better, to be quite honest, but they weren't doing post-mortems in the mornings. Um, that was the difference. So um, 
huge death rate when there was doing the uh, the pathological anatomy, and then onset of chlorine hand washing here, and it completely plummeted. So we've got a temporal correlation followed by a temporal correlation, which in this case is absolutely, we now know emphatically causal. But 